Hi, everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. Joining me now is Mariana Katsarova, Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the Russian Federation. Mariana, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. I want to talk about a recent tragic event and the situation that unfolded after. ISIS claimed responsibility for a mass terror attack in Moscow last month that killed over 130 people. In response, the alleged suspects behind the shooting showed signs of being tortured after they were taken into custody. What do you make of the, what do you make of the alleged torture of those terror suspects? Yes, uh, it was horrifying to see the videos that were circulated um, a couple of days after uh, 22nd of March, after the terrorist attack in Moscow. But before that, the four suspects, who are Tajik citizens, um, were taken to court. They were taken to Basmanik District Court in Moscow, and they were all displaying uh, signs of torture. Um, I mean, it was shocking why, uh, not because um, the international human rights community or I as, as working on these issues for many years, it's not because we didn't know that torture has been routinely used in police custody, in prisons, in detention in the Russian Federation. But what was shocking was that the Russian authorities seem to um, purposefully have been displaying these videos of horrific torture uh, one of the suspects were uh, subjected to electric shocks um, with cables connected to his genitalia. Another one, his ear was cut and a police officer was trying to force it into his mouth. And the third one, his eye was, um, he had to undergo an emergency surgery because of um, his eye being injured as a result of torture. And the authorities were displaying this somehow publicly not only in front of the judge, and the question is why the judge in the Basmani court, after seeing that the four suspects were clearly subjected to torture, did not react, did not, um, um, you know, uh, issue um, and made arrangements in a different way and issue a judgment, um, but continue with, um, with the hearing as usual why the lawyers who were given by the state to represent uh, the fourth the fourth suspects did not file complaints about their medical condition about torture and it seems to me that the russian authorities have been trying to on one hand show the population in russia that they're active and they are pursuing the terrorist suspects on another level i think they were trying also to um frightened and instilled fear in um, other uh, migrant workers in Russia, other people from Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Croatia, and they have plenty of them. And after the uh, terrorist attack and after the display of these torture methods, the Russian authorities started a campaign of cracking down on migrant workers and on Tajik nationals. So many people have been just stopped for routine police um, checks of their passport. A number of them have been now um, charged under the administrative code. Some were deported. Others just ran away from the Russian Federation because they've been afraid for their future. They're afraid to be um, Know, to be targeted by the authorities and the same torture methods to be applied to them. So this is the atmosphere. Um, as I said, the Russian authorities have been routinely using torture in police custody and in prisons. However, this is different because it's now not behind closed doors and it's um, in a way paraded to the population as these are the tough methods that we will be using to crack down on any possible suspect. If you're saying that it's been used routinely, but behind closed doors, and now it is being paraded to the public, it is so public. I mean, just the visuals of this 
what appeared to be torture were so apparent. You saw someone wheeled in, they were barely conscious. You saw their faces completely bruised and swollen. The um, alleged footage of someone getting their ear cut off and be, it being shoved into their mouth. What do you think the impact is going to be of this now being so public and the lawyers not responding as well as the judge? I think it's trying really, the authorities are trying to instill fear uh, among the migrant workers, among the um, uh, migrants from Central Asia, um, the Tajiks, but also I think it's a way of um, instilling further fear in an already traumatized population like the people of Russia. I was really, um, uh, very concerned to read that on 22nd of March, in addition to the 11 suspects that the authorities uh, found in uh, connection to the terrorist attack, and nine of them have been taken into custody. Uh, yesterday, or a day ago, it um, appeared that uh, a Chechen man who was just going to work, um, legally living in Moscow, of such an ethnicity was, I would say, kidnapped. I mean, he was detained from a bus stop in Moscow on 22nd of March, immediately after the terrorist attack, and taken into custody. Two hours later, he was found dead. And when his mother, his wife, was asking questions, the authorities, the police, answered to them that he committed suicide. Uh, the man was going to work that evening, which also is very indicative of what was happening in Russia in the past decades, especially after the two Chechen wars. Um, the Chechen, the, the Chechens in uh, the Russian Federation, the people from the North Caucasus, have been the first and foremost suspects of any, you know, terrorist attacks or any wrongdoing, and the police have been um, so eager to find any suspects that the, this man was just taken from a bus stop. Apparently, the mother came out later to say that um, his mother, who was buried in Chechnya, she revealed that um, he was um, on his body. There are significant bruises. Um, his spine was broken. Clearly, he's been severely tortured, and as a result of that, he died in custody. So, I think it just shows um, to the Russian people um, even further traumatization of the society, traumatizing of society, it's already traumatized, but also trying to keep people in fear. Since the beginning of the um, uh, full-scale aggression of Russia against Ukraine two years ago, a number of laws have been changed in the Russian Federation in order to punish every manifestation of dissent, any anti-war expression by um, anti-war activists, by anybody really, by peaceful demonstrators, by human rights activists, human rights defenders, and we saw Last year, for example, that two poets who wrote poems, Russian poets, who wrote poems and recited them at a public gathering against the war in Ukraine, the police came for them, and one of them was raped by three police officers at detention. Raped for a poem, to be punished for writing a poem for peace. And later, these two poets were sentenced, one to seven years in prison and the other one to five, five and a half years in prison. Again, for being, using their voices, their talent, their art against the war. I'm not mentioning the name of the poet on purpose also because now in detention, it's very dangerous also being in Russian prison colony because if the other prisoners know that you have been raped by the police, Sometimes these people are subjected to further sexual violence in detention. So the lawyers didn't even raise uh, further the 
the initial allegation of torture and sexual violence against these men. But nobody is spared. In the Russian society, for example, uh, last year, since the beginning of the war in Ukraine, again, LGBT people, gay men and women, or trans people have been subjected to persecution. Um, and some of them have been subjected to torture, especially in the Chechen Republic in the North Caucasus. Also, honor killings are used uh, there against the LGBT community. There was an outcry, actually. Um, a number of people were injured, and some died under torture in police custody in Chechnya several years ago when uh, the government there, of the Chechen Republic, which is part of the Russian Federation, decided to cleanse the Republic of LGBT people. Now, what's happened in Chechnya happens all over Russia because the Supreme Court last year issued, of the Russian Federation, issued a special uh, decision pronouncing the entire LGBT movement, anybody really, uh, part of this movement, uh, they were pronounced extremists as extremist organization. Being accused of extremism in Russia leads to really long-term imprisonment. And already we're seeing the first cases appearing of people being detained. For example, a young woman being detained only because she was wearing in a cafe the rainbow uh, flag earrings. She was detained briefly under the administrative code, but um, we could well imagine that that would lead to criminal charges for extremism later. You mentioned earlier what uh, message you think <coughs> Russia is sending to the public over this, but how are the Russian people feeling? What is the sentiment and is anything going to change in society after seeing this, what appear to be blatant uh, a blatant torture. I mean, I saw in the first hours after the terrorist attack in Moscow, which uh, was quite shocking on so many levels, uh, let alone also that the police, the, the uh, law enforcement, weren't really there for a while to help the people. I think there was a lot of uh, bewilderment turning into anger in the society. Where where were the authorities? Where was the police? Where was the fire brigade? Um, you know, to come and, and assist the victims. At the same time, I noticed that because one of the suspects were actually um, working as a, um, uh, working in a hairdressing salon as a hairdresser, and this salon belonged to other. Tajik, um, ethnic Tajik people in Moscow. Uh, sorry, not in Moscow, outside Moscow, in a small town. And I noticed the anger of um, the people um, threatening online, uh, on the website of this, uh, of this hairdressing salon, that if uh, the Tajik nationals do not leave Russia immediately, that they will attack the salon. But we expect people to be uh, sometimes behaving irrationally when facing such tragedy as a terrorist attack. By the way, I was remembering from that day how um, after 9-11 in New York, some uh, representatives of the Sikh community, who, who weren't even Muslim, they were Indian, special Indian religion, uh, only because they were wearing turbans, they were chased or targeted by individuals who were really angry. This anger is understandable. I mean, it's not understandable. It's something which, of course, is irrational, but it happens around the world. But when the government of the country, when the police um, and the law enforcement that should be actually protecting the people, that should be uh, uh, upholding the rule of law, are the ones targeting uh, people despite presumption of innocence, we're not even arguing whether these sus suspects were guilty or not, uh, but also what kind of evidence are you getting about a terrorist attack from barely alive people who were just severely tortured. So all around the investigative techniques, as we call them investigative techniques, of the Russian authorities is very questionable whether 
you know, they're getting any result uh, because they're using severe torture. So from what you're saying, it sounds like you believe torture isn't even an effective way to gather information in the first place. And I want to read a title from an op-ed from the Moscow Times and get your response to it. The op-ed was entitled this. By torturing Moscow attack suspects, Russia risks radicalizing future terrorists. What do you think of that? Do you think that sentiment holds true? I think that um, I'm not sure there is no um, obvious science behind what really radicalizes terrorists, but I personally always believe that um, terrorism is some, um, on one level, it's um, it's a resort, the last resort of desperate people. It's the last resort of people that maybe haven't been heard enough. I do believe in, in dialogue. And as you know, um, I mean, I think the dialogue even with war criminals, because we have to, in the end, what matters is saving lives. Um, and as you well know, um, we've seen it in, um, you know, in the defeat of, of law enforcement around the world, but they don't negotiate with terrorists. Many, many governments do not negotiate with terrorists. Uh, but I'm a human rights uh, expert, so I have a different approach. Um, I think what uh, what the torture, the use of torture on display is doing, it's terrorizing the Russian society and also showing that there are no boundaries, um, let alone international law obligations of the Russian Federation, let alone their own legal standards. Law, uh, torture is prohibited in all circumstances. That's why at the UN we have the UN United Nations Convention Against Torture. Russia is a party of this convention. No circumstances could be an excuse. We know of some countries and some governments that actually have even put on their legal books on the law that torture in some circumstances is allowed. I think in all circumstances, uh, torture as investigative technique never leads to to the truth. Because of course, under torture, anybody would admit doing anything, really just to, to make the torture stop. Russia hasn't uh, uh, signed and ratified yet the second optional protocol of uh, the Convention Against Torture, but the main document, it has ratified and it's forbidden in Russia to torture in all circumstances. We also see political prisoners in Russia. Navalny, Alexei Navalny, for example, has been kept under torturous conditions. It may not be the beatings and the electric shocks, but it's Putin repeatedly, Navalny, for example, spent 296 days um, in punishment cell in, under torturous conditions of detention which uh, might have led to, to his death, but the Russian authorities are not really yet revealing what are the circumstances about his death. We now see it with other political prisoners. They don't get access to medical care, have put one in prison, or they have been put repeatedly in these punishment cells with really subhuman conditions, and, and they are in solitary confinement there. So. The psychiatry, like in the old Soviet times, the psychiatry, the forced psychiatric treatment, uh, has been used again by the authorities in Russia in connection to the war against Ukraine. Um, Anti-war activists and um, uh, government critics have been subjected to, um, you know, some of them to um, enforced incarceration in psychiatric treatment, involuntary. Um, so I think um, given the brutality with which um, the Russian authorities have been mobilizing men all over the Russian Federation, sending them to fight the Ukraine, now we're seeing it with some of the migrants migrant workers uh, who have been forced to go and um, fight in Ukraine against their will, really. Uh, asylum seekers as well. 
uh, indigenous people in Siberia, in the remote places of Russia, they have been brutally mobilized without really asking them, just taken from their homes door to door by the Russian authorities. And given this display of torture by, uh, by the government, by the law enforcement, I think um, it's a very dangerous precedent in the society. We already have uh, the Ministry of Defense of the Russian Federation uh, taking recruits, mobilizing prisoners, sometimes prisoners who have been sentenced to life imprisonment for killing uh, somebody or for sexual violence, rape and murder, and promising them, uh, promising them to uh, their record to be deleted, for them to be then released, and sending them to fight in Ukraine. This was started at the beginning of the war against Ukraine by a paramilitary formation, the so-called Wagner Group of Mr. Prigozhin, who is now allegedly dead, um, uh, after a, uh, you know, after a, an attack against him and um, and his immediate circle. Um, but it was the Wagner group, the paramilitary group, that was allowed somehow to go to Russian prisons and get all these prisoners and amnesty them, but send them to fight in Ukraine. Now, after Wagner, after the Wagner group, is the Russian Minister of Defense that is using this technique. And we see a society where we have not only these prisoners, but also other men who have been fighting in, in Ukraine, returning then into the society. But particularly with the prisoners, they have repeated offenses, many of them. They either start raping again in peaceful Russia, or they start murdering again. And we see the level of domestic violence increasing in the society. Mind you, Russia is a country which does not have a law prohibiting domestic violence, um, which is shocking of itself with the level of violence against women in the society. So you have the so-called heroes from the special military operation returning back in civilian life, and the first victims of their aggression are their spouses, their wives, their children. There has been several cases in court where the judges, uh, in cases where uh, men who returned from the war and then killed uh, their wives, they're receiving lesser punishment only because they were heroes from the special military operation. So they're receiving a much lesser punishment for a crime which otherwise somebody would have been punished. So the use of torture, the use of brutality, uh, by the state spreads, I think, as a, if you want, on one level, instills fear in the peace-loving citizens. On another level, it brutalizes further the relations in the society. And also it shows impunity. And when there is impunity, we expect anything, not just by the authorities, but in the general population. If uh, nobody is responsible for, um, you know, for torturing somebody with electric shocks in their genitals, for three police officers raping the poet for a poem. I think um, it's a society in crisis. It's a society in, um, in crisis of the rule of law and of human rights, really. Mariana Katsarova, thank you so much for your expertise on this really important conversation. I hope you can join me again soon.